Podcast. Now it's right back at it. UFC Vegas 91. We got a fight car going down at the Apex Center. And this week, it's not a heavyweight card. It's not one of the things we normally complain about. It is a rare flyweight main event. We've got Alex Perez back in action after looking very good against Mohamed Mokayev, taking on Mateus Nicolau in his first UFC main event. He's a guy who's been around for a long time. I bet on him in the past, cashed on a uh, you know, very small underdog ticket against Manel Cap back in the day. And if you guys are not aware, this was supposed to be Manel Cap versus Mateus Nicolau in the main event of the evening. And unfortunately, Manel Cap, for the you know trillionth time in his UFC career, forced to pull out from the fight. Unfortunate news. So now what do we got instead? We got Alex Perez stepping up on short notice. And if you guys have been paying attention to the game for a long time, you know Alex Perez is a guy that isn't always reliable to make it to the scale, isn't always reliable to make it into the octagon, doesn't always make the weight class. So a couple things that we got to see, you know, shake out here in terms of the weigh-in. There's a lot, uh, you know, to still develop over the course of the week. But you guys are here for the first look. So what do we always do on the first look? If you guys are new here, want to welcome you aboard. Say hi. My name's Liam. Hope you guys are having a great night. Hope this uh, you know episode finds you well. What we're going to do today, we're going to give our first look at the card. What that means is over the course of the week, I'm going to do more research. I'm going to do more tape study. We're going to come back to you on Thursday with much more developed opinions. Uh, but what I do have for you today is my first thoughts on the card. And so we've got an interesting card. We have uh, some great fights to break down. And the way we always do it on the first look, we start at the main event and then we work our way on down the card. When you guys come back for bets and banter on Thursday later in the week, we start at the bottom and work our way on up. But this time we're going to start with this main event of the evening. So as I mentioned, Mateus Nicolau, why is he here? Why is he getting this main event spot? I can tell you guys, it's pretty straightforward. Mateus Nicolau has got an excellent professional record, right? That just jumps off the page at you, 19-3-1. Man, it's a solid record. Then you look and say to yourself, okay, well, how about at the UFC level? Has he been doing well in the UFC? Absolutely. Seven and two at the UFC level. And if we take a look at those results, he's got two stoppages, one knockout, one submission, five wins by decision. And both of his losses inside the organization came by way of knockout, unfortunately. So Mateus Nicola, what do we know about the guy? Very talented. He's skilled in all positions, right? Uh, on the feet. He's not a very high volume striker. He tends to be a counter striker. He likes to move away, use some lateral footwork. He likes to circle on the outside. And when he can get you to commit to a strike, he wants to counter. He wants to throw a big overhand right. Typically, he likes to use his setups. Uh, he might throw a couple shots in combination, but then he likes to skirt back out of there, right? He does not like to be an extended uh, combinations and exchanges because that's where he can get clipped. I think his chin is the most vulnerable part of his game. Even that fight against Manel Cap, you know, that was a close split decision. I cashed that ticket. I felt very fortunate to catch that ticket. I thought it was a very close fight. And I thought that what we saw from, uh, you know, Nicolau is he's crafty. He's dangerous in all positions. He had a beautiful guillotine entry in that fight as well. I think he would have finished lesser opponents than Manel Cap, who is like a title challenger level opponent. And when you have a guy like Mateus Nicolau, you know, He's got to find ways to fight uh, that that hide his vulnerabilities. Because if you look, it's kind of bookends on his career, right? He gets to the UFC, and his first fight is a decision win over uh, Luis Smolka. He beat John Moraga at the Ultimate Fighter finale as well, a uh, split decision. And then he fights Dustin Ortiz with a head of momentum, and he gets knocked out in the first round. Big head kick, big follow-up ground and pound shots from Dustin Ortiz, pretty brutal stoppage. Then he gets cut from the promotion and he goes back to future FC. He gets a win over uh, Felipe Efrain in brave FC. Then he comes back and the fight I mentioned with Manel Cap, he gets the win via split decision. Then he goes on to fight Tim Elliott, gets a unanimous decision win. I thought he looked pretty good in that fight. Um, you know, Tim Elliott, obviously a savvy veteran, but he doesn't have the knockout power to necessarily test a guy like Nicolau. Then you look at David Dvorak, another guy who's not really known for his stopping power, uh, for his big knockout ability. So I think that those were forgiving matchups. The, the Manel Cap fight, that was a brutal matchup. And the fact that Mateus Nicolau survived that does tell you he can even go out there and beat a power puncher. But you, you think about the prospect of him doing it over five rounds. With that chin, it does become a little bit sketchy, and he's got to really manage his fight and pick his moments. As for the Matt Schnell fight, I mean, with all due respect, Matt Schnell is probably the most chinny flyweight in the UFC. Um, you know, Shannon Ross uh, is maybe the most chinny uh, flyweight in the history of mixed martial arts, but 
currently on the UFC roster as it's constructed, I would think that, um, you know, Matt Schnell's right up there with, with a guy who's very so, uh, solid, very talented, just doesn't have the chin to back it up necessarily, uh, the durability to go out there and be in these hard, uh, sustained gunfights. So when I'm looking at a matchup like this, I say to myself, man, you got a guy in Mateus Nicolau, 5-0 and career to the submission, right? He's got a very good ground game. I think that Perez is well-versed on the ground. We've seen that, right? He went out there with Mikhaev last time, looked very competent in his wrestling and his grappling and his techniques. But we also know that, you know, 5-0 and to the sub doesn't tell you he's going to go out there and get it every time. His one submission win in the UFC was uh, – a Japanese necktie over Bruno Correa in the third round back in 2015, coming off the ultimate fighter, Bruno Correa. It never really worked out for him at the UFC level. So, you know, there's just a couple of things that, that stand out to me as a little bit concerning here. Um, you know, three first round losses, all via knockout Pedro Nobre back in 2012 was able to take out Mateus Nicolau. You kind of just wash that one away. But then we talk about the fact that Dustin Ortiz was able to clip him. Okay. Dustin Ortiz no longer with the promotion, but a solid fighter. You know, you give him a little bit of a pass there. Most recently, Brandon Roy Val guy who's going to challenge for the title uh, type of guy, you know, a, a guy who's certainly right at that title level and Roy Val was, uh, you know, was able to catch him with that knee very early on. Brutal finish, hurt him, dropped him, rocked him, landed big follow-up ground and pound. So I think the pattern that we're seeing emerge is that Mateus Nicolau can be hurt on the feet. He can be rocked on the feet. But barring that, he's a pretty talented guy. You know, I think the way you'd have to beat Mateus Nicolau more often than not, if you don't knock him out, is you're going to have to win a very close tactical split decision because i don't think he's going to give you a ton of opportunities i think if the fight goes the full 15 or 25 it means that nicolaus spent a lot of time skirting the octagon moving his feet not engaging in the pocket um you know finding his moments using uh you know his little chip shot jab uh and and some movement but now let's talk about the other side of this matchup because alex perez Definitely gets a lot of grief. You know, if you've been a MMA fan only for a couple of years, you've never seen this guy win a fight. Um, you know, most of the time you're seeing this guy pull out of fights, you know, not make it to the booking, not not uh, have an answer, you know, uh, when, when his name is called. But when you're looking at Alex Perez, let's just look at the losses for him recently. And we'll take out any grappling matches that have taken place. He's got Muhammad Makayev. He fought him in March of this year. Um, you know, so maybe six weeks ago, uh, something like that, six or seven weeks ago, Alex Perez was out there fighting Mikhaev, and I didn't think he took a lot of damage. I did think he looked like, um, you know, he came out of that fight pretty pretty healthy. So hats off to him, you know, more power to him. Uh, Mikhaev was not feeling well for that fight, and uh, allegedly, right, he was sick. He, he wasn't feeling well. So he went out there and just eked out a decision, did enough to get the job done. Very, very close fight. I thought rounds two and three were particularly close. Um, and so shout out to Alex Perez going out there, putting on a, a solid fight, finally making it to the cage. And uh, he did everything right. I believe he even made weight for that contest. You know, then he has the Pantoja fight. Listen, Pantoja is the current champion. Everybody likes the guy. Everybody respects the guy. And if he gets to that rear naked choke position, you know, he's going to finish most guys in the division. He's going to finish a lot of people in the sport. And that tends to be the, the you know, fatal flaw, if you will, of Alex Perez, right? You go look at the guy's record. He's seven and five career to the submission. So unlike Mateus Nicolau, five and oh career to the submission, you got seven and five for Alex Perez career to the submission. So is he inept? Is he incompetent? Does he not have an ability to get submission wins? No, he absolutely does. You know, we saw him go out there and submit Jordan Espinosa with an arm triangle choke in the first round. I posted that video up on Twitter earlier today. Then you look, um, you know, back in the day, Carlos John de Tomas, Back in 2017, um, he was able to Darce choke him. He was able to submit Kevin Gray on the Contender Series in 2017 with that Anaconda choke as well to earn his way into the UFC. So Alex Perez definitely has some submission offense. But then you got to think about the submission defense. I think that's the big difference between these two guys on the mat. I think Mateus Nicolau is a little more sound. I think he's a little more positional. I think he's a little more educated with his jiu-jitsu. I think that Alex Perez, on the other hand, is very solid. He can scramble but he's also prone to making a little bit more basic mistakes. I think he's a little bit more limited in his knowledge. I think that his ability to compete is still very high level. So, you know, a, a path for Mateus Nicolau here is definitely the submission. He is a excellent submission grappler. Uh, I think it would be wise for him to try and not engage this fight on the feet for as long as he can and to keep it on the mat 
where he could potentially present an advantage. We have seen other guys get to Perez um, on the mat. So if we go back through the record, let's just go th- look through. It was uh, Pantoja with the rear naked choke. Makayev out-wrestled him to a close decision. Davison Figueiredo finished him with the guillotine choke after a brilliant series. Again, another thing that I tweeted out, guys, at Liam Picks Fights, Figgy, um, you know, the, the guy's guillotine sequence, it's just unbelievable because he starts with a leg lock entry when he's going against Alex Perez. And when he was able to get, um, you know, him knocked off balance and get him to the ground, both hands posted, he was able to then come up um, and uh, and find the, the finish in transition. You know, Perez was doing some of the right things, trying to scramble, trying to move, and he got caught in an arming guillotine that he had no chance to recover from. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Well, I got to give the credit and respect there to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Davison Figueiredo, who, speaking of UFC 300, just went out there and submitted Cody Garbrandt, um, you know, 135 pound champion. I don't believe he'd ever been submitted before in his career, if my memory serves. So, um, obviously, Figueiredo is extremely talented. Then a ground and pound finish for Joseph Benavidez. Um, that that fight, for whatever reason, does not stand out to me, um, you know, in my memory bank. But I believe Joseph heard him on the feet. Uh, if my memory serves there, then you have the arm bar loss back in 2016 at the Tachi palace fights. Uh, he lost via prayer choke guillotine against Adam Antolin, um, a couple guillotine losses earlier in his career as well. So seems like one position where he's particularly vulnerable is that guillotine. You guys know me. I'm a sucker for a good guillotine choke. And I think that Mateus Nicolau has a very good guillotine choke. I do not think that Alex Perez wants to engage, um, you know, in the grappling here. I think if I'm Alex Perez and I'm in his corner, if I'm coaching Alex Perez, I'm telling him, hey, listen, man, you got real good skills with the takedown defense, especially that first layer. You start to extend some of the exchanges. You start to put him in some worse positions um, or you catch him in a, a transitional sub. You know, he can make some mistakes, but he's got pretty good ideas about how to disengage, how to break these clinches a little bit um, and, and how to defend that first layer entry on the takedown. And I think that if he's able to defend some takedowns here, you know, Alex Perez is not as sharp as a guy like Nicolau. He's maybe not as crafty, but he throws a decent volume on the feet. He'll go out there and attempt some strikes. If he feels like he's got you breaking, he will unload with a combination. He will try and get, um, you know, a, a series of punches going in a row. We've also seen him go out there and secure leg kick finishes in the UFC. Not a very common occurrence, but this guy goes out there and slaps the calf, man. He's willing to go out there, throw a lot of leg kicks, try and pick away at your calf. He's willing to do, um, you know, a number on you over time, right? He's willing to pick away slow and steady, bing, bing, just chip away at that calf and eventually take you out of the fight. Uh, That's been a trademark move for Alex Perez in the UFC. If we go back and refer to his record, his most recent win in the UFC, a leg kick stoppage over former title challenger, Juicy 8 for Miga. Uh, and then we also saw him go out there and stop Jose Torres at the time, an undefeated fighter, 8-0. Uh, he was able to stop him with strikes on the feet as well. So he's a guy that's got, um, you know, an interesting game. He's got skills in all positions, but he hasn't been supremely active. He's 6-4 and four in the promotion, so not as clean and uh, prestigious a record as a guy like Mateus Nicolau. But you also got to acknowledge he's been fighting some of the highest level guys in the division, the Pantojas, the Figueiredos, the Makayevs. Um, even the Benavidez, when Benavidez was around, he was a top guy in the division. So I think that there's a lot. Oh, shout out to, uh, Nan, uh, excuse me, Nan Dalal, Nan Dalal. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. My brother, sharpest chat in the game. Thank you for being here. He says Benavidez hit AP with, uh, the legal strikes and a cheeky nodder. Hey, uh, you know, the Jack Slack special, the old cheeky nodder, little headbutt. Henry Cejudo used to go for those a little bit as well. Hey, all spare and love and war, right? And uh, I think that unfortunately, it's, it's the way that it goes sometimes with these guys that like to do that blitz style. They can clash heads a little bit. And uh, I think that for Perez, you know, the way he wins this fight is he pressures forward. He puts Nicolau on the back foot. He makes him second guess himself. He uses that veteran savvy and that experience. And he goes out there and puts some hands on this kid and some really hard low kicks and tries to catch him out of stance and catch him out of position. The one thing we got to note is if you want to be like uh, a Mateus Nicolau and be evasive in the pocket and use a lot of uh, evasive footwork, trying to skirt around the outside of the octagon, every style has pros and cons, right? And one of the cons with that style, we saw it with Dominic Cruz against the aforementioned Henry Cejudo. The last thing to leave range always is your leg right? Because if you're trying to propel yourself in another direction, you have to push off your leg. And so 
oftentimes, um, if you have a really good low kicker, they can try and target your leg as you're leaving range. Um, and you've kind of left your leg behind trying to skirt away to the open space. So I do think that that's something that we want to watch for here is if Perez has a good game plan uh, and it's hard to know what his game plan is going to look like, right? Six weeks to prepare for the fight, but you know, he does know how to throw low kicks. We know that about him. He's got good boxing fundamentals for the most part. We know that about him. So I think that he could go out there and, you know, use his combination striking to get some advantages on Mateus Nicolau. But I think that if, if he allows this to be, a low tempo cardio kickboxing match. I just think Nicolaus a little bit cleaner, a little bit more technical, might land a couple big counter right hands uh, off balance his opponent. That could create some submission opportunities as well, potential club and sub. So overall, I think that Nicolaus has some decent strikes, but I don't expect him to stop a guy like Perez, who I do think is durable, who I think is tough uh, in the striking. You know, I think his quick positions, the the things that break him are when he gets caught in spots where he feels like he can't get out. He feels constricted. He feels, uh, you know, wrapped up. That's what a guillotine's like. You know, it's like somebody's trying to rip your damn head off. And I think that for, you know, Nicolau, he's trying to rip this guy's head off. He's trying to get him to the ground. He's trying to put him in a vice grip. He's trying to expose his ground game. And I think that for Perez, you're trying to keep this fight up, right? Sprawl, brawl, pressure, back this kid up and put some hands on him. And I just don't know what to make of this one yet. You know, I, I feel like from a gut level standpoint, I can't bet on a guy like Nicolau at significant shock, given what I know about his chin, um, you know, given the way I've seen him, you know, go to some close decisions with top guys in this division. I don't know that he could justify that big price for me. 65%. You know, that's a big ask against another elite fighter. Who, and I think Alex Perez did look elite last time out against Makayev. Maybe Makayev's just way overrated, right? But Makayev was one fight away from a title shot. Right. You understand that if he finished Alex Perez, we're not having a Steve Ursay conversation. Right. Makayev gets the title shot in Brazil if he had finished uh, in his most recent fight. So I think Perez kind of went out there and made a better account of himself than the matchmakers expected, than Makayev expected, certainly than I expected as well. So I think that Alex, you know, it's good for him to get back in there so quick. When you've got a guy that has been struggling with inactivity, that hasn't been able to get inside the cage, that hasn't been able to keep that. Uh, you know, weight loss regimen, the championship lifestyle, I think frequency of activity is huge. So Alex Perez showing that discipline, that willingness to get back in there, it could be one of two things. It could be, I'm here for a check. I don't care. Uh, I'll put myself in suboptimal conditions, take the fight on short notice. Doesn't matter to me. Or it could be, Hey, I'm staying in shape. I'm ready to compete right now. I want my opportunities and I'm willing to take them even if they're on short notice. I mean, this is a guy that again, overperformed, I would say, last time out as an underdog. Looked like it could have been, you know, darn near a pick em price, right? Very close fight. Obviously, Makai maybe a slight favorite. But when you look at how it played out, you know, Perez did better than people thought. And Mateus Nicola, last time out, is coming off a brutal knockout loss. Let's not mistake it, right? He's coming off a loss where he got brutally need, hit with a big shot, um, you know, dropped. And it kind of exposed that even though he's gotten better, even though he's been making some improvements, even though he's got real skills in all positions, we saw it happen, you know, a long time ago, right? Where he got knocked out by Dustin Ortiz pretty brutally early on. And then we saw the same thing against Pedro Nobert on the regional scene before that. And then we saw it again. It's like, it's always been the same problem. Getting knocked out in the first round, getting clipped, getting hit with big shots and getting put down. And he does a lot of dipping into his stance, right? Because the one other thing I'll mention about Nicolau is Loading up that right hand for the counter is brilliant when it works, but when it doesn't work, you know, you kind of see um, times where, you know, Nicolau is just loaded up with his whole body crouched down. And that's where he got hit with the knee from Roy Val. That's where he gets hit, um, you know, with Dustin Ortiz throwing that high kick up at him. So there's just been a couple of times where he kind of like sits into a posture where it, it allows people to land big shots on him. And I think that for Nicolau, that's what he's got to be um, very disciplined about in this fight is making sure he's either all the way in or all the way out of range uh, that he's able to to use that lead hand to keep some space uh, when he's loading up the right hand he's got to make it count he's got to land those shots and get out of the way um, so I think it's a fascinating fight I lean towards it being a dogger pass situation on the money line right now um, you know but I, I have no bets on the fight if I had to lean towards what I would consider betting in this spot, I think I would consider betting, um, you know, the underdog in the main event. I think I would consider betting uh, the fight ends by submission um, or, you know, particularly that Nicolau by submission prop. Um, I think that 
Both guys have a path, but I think Nikolaj is clearly a much better grappler. For Perez, I think it would have to be a club and sub type situation. I think you would have to get Nikolaj a little bit, um, you know, flustered, uh, out of out of sorts, so to speak. And shout out to um, the chat. Let's see what the chat has to say about this great main event, guys. We got Daz Dillinger says, if Alex was a pressure fighter or had heavy hands, I'd consider taking him. But like I said, he's shit. Uh, Alex has had a lot of injuries too. I'm pretty sure that's why he's had long gaps between fights. He's had some injuries. He's had some personal stuff. He's been building businesses. He's had a lot of different things. Um, but I do think that he still showed a, uh, a very serious, uh, skill set in his last fight. And I think that for Nicolau, you know, he's got a lot of skills. He, he is a guy that the UFC would like to get behind, but they've tried to get behind him before, right? They tried to put him in winnable situations. You know, give him great opportunities. I thought he was a better grappler than Brandon Roy Val. We never got to see it play out, right? Because he got starched pretty quick. So I think that he's got clear, um, you know, hard to overcome flaws uh, about his durability, right? Because at the end of the game, it's the hurt business. And if you can't take a good shot, it's hard to fight. It's hard to fight, especially at a really high professional level. So um, that's that's one thing I'm taking away here. Shout out to Holly in the chat. Uh, you know, we don't always get female viewers here, Holly. So we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you. Good luck, man. Um, uh, good luck to you too, Holly. Thank you so much. Shout out to the hitman in the chat it says Liam late night. Love it. Absolutely. Brother wanted to get going a little bit earlier today, but unfortunately we were not able to, uh, because I had a little bit of technical difficulties. It wouldn't be my show if there wasn't technical difficulties, but we still made it. We're on the air and we're happy to be here. So thank you so much. Shout out to Kadeem says brewing coffee. You know that we got one coffee right here in the coffee and jujitsu brewing confidence on the mats uh mug we've got the odds mug stacked with coffee so we're absolutely stacked and prepared um shout out to kadeem says liam the man himself salute it's a salute to you my brother shout out to avery says hello from georgia hello georgia welcome aboard thank you for being here my friend uh shout out to eden roos is laying this foundations for what we're going to talk about next as span about to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory once again he's talking of course about the co-main event of the evening shout out to nandalal rasaya uh says nikola winning and losing itd on that leaping lead hook you're absolutely right he takes a lot of risks with that we've got joshua frick says what's up liam what's up joshua thank you for being here kalashram says karini silva via submission is the lock of the week. Oh my. Shout out to Colostrum putting it on the table early. So there you go. Shout out to Greenbelt Warriors says Liam is for the West Coasters. You know we're rocking on the East Coast all night long, baby. So our West Coast brethren, our West Coast friends, welcome aboard. Thank you guys for being here. The man, the myth, the legend, you're far too kind, my brother. Mason in the building. Dylan says, dumb question. Uh, how do we know AP has better cardio. Yeah, I'm not even saying he does have better cardio. I think he's got more experience in five-round fights and booked five-round fights as in a title fight. He's been scheduled for five-round main events before. He's been scheduled for, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, title fights, right? So five-round title fights. Even if they end in the first round, they're scheduled to go five hard fives. So I'm sure he put in the camps, had the preparation for that. Um, but yeah, it, it is an open question. I would say a little bit for both of these guys because Perez just hasn't had, you know, long extended difficult fights, but I would say that Makaya fight was a sign that he's moving in the right direction. Thought he looked cardiovascular. Um, you know, his cardiovascular preparation was on point for that fight. And, uh, I thought he actually may have looked like the fresher guy late in the fight. So Great question, and I appreciate it. If you guys have more questions, comments, concerns, go ahead and fire them off in the chat. And if we don't get to them live on the air, no problem. Go ahead and fire them off in the comment section down below. Try and get back to you guys as soon as possible. And I appreciate all the comments, all the feedback, uh, whether it's positive, negative, indifferent. I appreciate what you guys have to say about the show. So thank you for contributing. 